Brown has been out of this country during the past 40 years. Granada this Friday is celebrating, having gone on the air this very day, May the 3rd, 1956. So we have gone through the archives to bring you some broadcasting high spots. In an hour we go behind bars with country star Johnny Cash and his notorious 1969 concert inside San Quentin Jail. That's at 11.35. Until then, Anthony Wilson has some more sounds for you. to Oasis, the northwest of England has made some pretty remarkable popular music. A kind of cultural world domination amply reflected by its local television station. From the Stones to the Stone Roses, you might say, Granada has produced some quite remarkable music television. And this is where we keep it, the archives. Pop, punk, rock and roll, northern soul even. Give us a break, it's an archive show. We thought we'd show you the archive. Besides which, over the next 50 minutes, we're going to bring out some of our best shots. Through the mists of time, cue the mist, thank you very much. Come, classic moments, unique collaborations, previously unseen footage. Most of all, a collection of early performances of fantastic songs. There's a kind of rule at Granada that uh, if it's happening, it should be on. 40 years ago, when we started, this was happening. I'm all over, baby. Oh. Jerry's got the food by the home. Yeah, and I ain't faking. I got the whole lot of shaking going on. Well, I did shake, baby, shake. I did shake, baby, shake. I did shake it, baby, shake it. I did shake, baby, shake. Come on over. Oh, lot of shaking going on. Jerry Lee Lewis was one of the giants of rock and roll, brought over by one of the giants of British television, Johnny Hamm. My thing was to find new talent. I had to sell the idea, obviously, to my boss, who was Cecil Bernstein at the time. And uh, when I said I'd like to do this show with Jerry Lee Lewis and Gene Vincent, uh, he obviously didn't know who they were. And uh, he said, well, what do these two girls do? <laughs> Well, be by blue, she's my baby. Be by blue, don't be baby. Be by blue, she's my baby. Be by blue, don't be baby. Be by blue, she she she. She's the queen of all the teams. She's the woman that I know. She's the woman that loves me so say. Granada didn't just give the rockers some of their first ever TVs. We also helped give 60s pop its defining look, the scaffolding. Things like the scaffolding and such like, you could get quite large structures built quickly and cheaply. We didn't put cycloramas of blacks in, we used the studio walls to a large extent, so you never disguised the fact that you were shooting the thing in a studio. Um, and it was lit in a fairly sort of uh, hard and uh, sort of noir way, you know, with sort of light slashes down the walls. Performers like Little Richard came in, they wouldn't do a standard rehearsal, so they'd come in and give a performance. Wah ba 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 
Those programs were transmitted at uh, peak time. Uh, music, unfortunately, these days seems to be relegated to half past ten at night or eleven o'clock. You know, no one seems to watch. But they got viewers. I mean, the, the one we did with Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard um, went out, I think, at about seven thirty. We actually got sixty thousand letters asking for it to be repeated. And it wasn't just studio. Our OB crews also got in on the act. When the blues and gospel train pulled into town, we dressed up Chalton Station like the Deep South, so Muddy Waters would feel totally at home. Had money in the bank. Got went down for the descent. The bank's in trouble. Got went down for the descent. You can't spend what you ain't got. You can't lose something that you ain't never. So, we were big on bringing in the Yanks, but by 62, we had the biggest group in the world right on our doorsteps and all to ourselves, before we had to share them with everybody else. Yeah, well, the Beatles came in to do Scene at 6.30, which was a local magazine programme, every time they had a new record. And they must have come about six or seven times. And they were due to come in to do I Want to Hold Your Hand. I had this feeling that it was going to be the last time that it would ever come into the studio. The scene at 6.30 anyway. And um, so I had a film camera follow them every minute that they were there. They were there about three, four hours. And uh, I mean, John Lennon hated it. He didn't want to know about this to start with. On the 27th of November, 1963, the Beatles came through these doors into Studio 4 at Granada to record three songs. They did This Boy, Twist and Shout, and they should have done Please Mr. Postman, because this is now our post room. But they didn't. What they did, in fact, was... Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. I worked in here as well. Thank you. I want to hold your hand. Oh, yeah, i tell you something I think you'll understand Can I say that something I want to hold your hand I want to hold your hand I want to hold your hand Oh, please, say to me And when the Beatles toured America, we went along for the ride, following the Fab Four as they swept across the states. It's such a feeling that my love, I can hide, I can and when they returned, it was for one last Granada special. The music of Lennon and McCartney saw the stars of the day singing or not their favourite Beatles songs. I was worried about asking Peter Sellers to do uh, Hard Day's Night. As well as Olivia, as Richard III because he was a, a Hollywood superstar at that time, and I thought he may not do it. And I, I got his phone number and rang him at home, and, it, and the show was about six weeks off. We were just in the planning stages. And I said, asked him if he would appear, and he said, yes, dear boy. He said, I'll do it on Monday of next week. So I, thought, <laughs> I said, yes, that'll be fine. It has been a hard day's night. <laughs> and I have been working like a dog. It's been a hard day's night. I should be sleeping like a log. But when I get home to you, I find the things that you do will make me feel all right. <laughs> you know I work all day to get you money to buy you things. And it's worth it just to hear you say, you'll give me everything. That's why I love to come home. Cause when I get you, you know I feel okay. <laughs> when I 
came home, everything seems to be right. When I'm home, feeling you, <laughs> holding me, hi. Hi. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly, I'm not half the one I used to be. There's a shadow. Sometimes we had to beat off stiff opposition to land the big names. Simon and Garfunkel were lured to Manchester by producer John Shepherd. Well, I happened to know the man who was going to be handling their British visit, and I persuaded him that an hour with me was better than one song on top of the pot. Now, it was an hour. You were that lying, we... of course. You knew you were lying. Um, no, I don't know that I, I, I was consciously lying. I, I. Um... I certainly would, would say that the show that eventuated is a much better show and it's a show for which I know Paul Simon feels some nostalgia because he didn't he phone up Granada sometime and, and get a copy made because it was the best version of Sounds of Silence they ever recorded. Hello darkness my old friend I've come to talk with you again because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping and the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence in restless dreams I walked alone narrow streets of cobblestone I think it does have a sort of pure, old-fashioned, black-and-white quality about it. And it, the second thing is a sort of private, technical thing. The fact of the matter is that a large part of the studio was unpopular because nobody had heard of Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> the show is quite a skillful job of making it look as though there's a lot of people there. Simon and Garfunkel went out in the Granada region only. This guy got a network slot and the car to drive around London. You could say we anticipated the easy listening revival by a full 30 years. I made a record of a song two years ago in America. I thought it was a pretty great record. Till I got a record in the mail from London of the same song by Dusty Springfield, which I thought was so much better than the record that I had made. By the mid-60s, pop music was developing its own cultural and political agenda and as such was beginning to attract the attention of another 60s phenomenon, World in Action. The documentary makers here regarded the new counterculture as a subject worthy of their labours. The result, some of the most memorable music television ever made. 
Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones leader, sentenced to jail a month ago on drugs charges, is free. Earlier today, he won his appeal against the prison sentence, and tonight he flew by helicopter to an outside broadcast location 30 miles from London to appear in World in Action. Johnny Cash is a folk singer. In this film, he sings to an audience, many of whom have known violence at first hand. They are the inmates of one of the toughest prisons in America, San Quentin in California. Put your hand out, please. Like many of their contemporaries, the doors show more clearly what they're against rather than what they're for. This film is an attempt to illustrate their report on the state of the world. The doors' message is uncompromisingly loud. Please do not adjust your set. The Doors of the Roundhouse, one of the most legendary concerts of the 60s, filmed for Granada by John Shepard and Joe Durden Smith. I mean, it was an extraordinary event. I mean, these things just hadn't been done. Here's an American player coming to play in the Roundhouse, right? The people who heard them were obsessed by them. So you had this absolutely electrifying kind of atmosphere there. And everybody was high on that as much as on anything else, though they were certainly high on everything else as well, I suppose. Of all the programs I've ever made, it's the one that people can't go on coming up to me and saying, yeah, yeah, what? Uh, is entirely an aspect of the Jim Morrison industry. It's a fictional documentary. I can't say too much about it because we're not really making it. It's just kind of making itself. Uh, I, I think, you know, personally, in my mind, the jury is out as to whether he was actually a sort of drunk and fairly vacant kind of a, you know, whatever, hunk, or whether he was indeed a poetic genius. I, I, I waver in my own mind between the two. Jim, and it was another of those most legendary concerts, the Rolling Stones in Hyde Park, a free concert for 500,000 fans, including Messrs. Shepard and Durden Smith. I got a call one day from Mick Jagger, whom I knew not very well, but knew, and he said, hello, Joe, you've got good crews, haven't you? <laughs> you've got good crews? You've got good crews. <laughs> and I said, yeah, and he said, well, I'm thinking of doing a bit of a concert in Hyde Park, what do you think? I said, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, Gr Granada paid for the building of the stage, um, which I think was about £3,000. And the cost of the rest of it was another 6000 It sounds like nothing now. I think it, it must have seemed to the, to the people who ran Granada today with Claride an enormous amount of money. And I think he thought at one time, we ought to do this. And I think we had to get very determined at that point and say, this is where it's happening, this is where it's at, this is it and we have to be there. This is it? Yeah. 2.30 p.m. Marianne Faithful, Nicholas and Mick Jagger leave their Chelsea home for the concert headquarters, a hotel near the park. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it, I really am. Nice one, Marianne. What's Charlie doing? What's Charlie going to do? He's going to play the drums. He's going to play the drums. drums. The greatest rock and roll band in the world. They're incredible. Let's hear it for the Stones.
Granada had unlimited access to the concert, which took place just two days after the death of Brian Jones. The Stones released the butterflies. We threw in the crash zooms. All those crash zooms are George Turner, the legendary Granada well, George camera. George Jesse, yes. Placed in a position where he was too far from the bloody stage. So all he can do, surrounded by half a million people enjoying themselves, is to liven up his impossible camera position is a series of crash zooms. Ah. He should have been. And I said so at the time, I said, <laughs> this boy should be at least 100 feet nearer the stage. The 60s are drawing to a close. These people are on their way to Altamont. We're on our way to the break. See you in part two. Hi, my name's Kevin Pinder, store manager being Hugh Wandsworth. We're introducing key season price. That is, seasonal products, like gardening at the moment, at very low prices. And we're so confident you won't find them lower anywhere else, that if you do, we're more than match the price we double the difference. I've been here eight years, and I think this offers the business. You can do it when you be and it. Imagine if you could choose a brand new fitted carpet. Any carpet in any color, patterned or plain, in any size, for any room, at any price. And make it yours right now for only $29.99 per month, interest-free. Well, at Carpet World, you can. Whether you spend £200 or £1,200, you pay the same. Just $29.99 per month, interest-free. And every single carpet comes at guaranteed lowest prices. That's what makes Carpet World Europe's leading carpet superstores. Another music, punk! Well, apparently, I've got to wait for my bit. There was other stuff going on in the 70s as well. Do you want me to get down on my knees? Beg you, baby, please cry a million tears. Do you want me to call you on the phone? Beg you to come home, think of all the years. Forget Manchester, forget Liverpool, this was Wigan, and we were there. And while director Tony Palmer was out searching for the young soul rebels, another Granada producer was bringing pop into the studio. The 70s saw a new kind of music show for a new kind of audience, the Teeny Boppers. These shows starred 70s icons like Aisha, The Arrows, Mr. Roy. And us. How did you come across the Bay City Rollers? Well, they had a first disc. It was called Keep On Dancing, as far as I remember. And I thought, these boys really have got a spark. And I was looking for an idea for a new series. So I thought the Bay City Rollers would be lovely. And I asked their manager if they would be interested. And he said, yes, yes, of course they would. And then their next hit was ginormous success. So I forgot the idea till the manager saw me in the street one day and said, hey, what about that series? The boys are still waiting. just hysterical with, with joy of being in the same place as the Rollers for a start. The main problems, apart from the screaming, they did behave themselves because they were, they were pretty well guarded. But it was dreadful for the sound department. It's, it's pretty awful for cameras trying to get around. And uh, every now and again, a small 
girl would escape and leap over the floor, and then we'd have to start again. It was the age when everyone smiled. It was the age before punk. Punk was trying to do what had already been done by the Stones. You see, when the Beatles came along and they were the pets, and then the Stones came along. I was in makeup once, and Mick Jagger came in and he said, can you make my T-shirt dirty? This was right at the start. Because our mums have washed our T-shirts, and they're all too clean, and wardrobe won't dirty them. So will you dirty them up? Because that was the image Absolutely. they wanted. Absolutely. Rebels. Rebel. So I think that that's really what happened with punk. They wanted to be rebels. They didn't want to be pretty faces. This is a new group called uh, Generation X. They have a lead singer called Billy Idol, who's supposed to be as pretty as me. We'll see now. Generation X. Forget Billy Idol, you were the prettiest. For once, being in at the end of a career was as cool as being in at the start. Perhaps he saw a way of um, getting the face back on the screen. Perhaps he was using me, but I didn't mind because his songs were so magical. They weren't teeny bopper in the way the other teeny boppers were completely, um, you know, well, nursery rhyme-ish almost. But Mark had magic in his work, like Ride a White Swan. Do you remember Ride a White Swan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mystical. He was, he was a mystic, I found, and uh, in a way he had an affinity with children. Ride it on out like a bird in the sky west. Ride it on out like you were a bird. Fly it on out like an eagle in a sunbeam. Ride it on out like you were a bird. Seventy-six and seventy-seven were interesting times at Granada. While the pop groups and the dancers, hello, smiled their ways into the hearts of the young down in Studio Six, a bunch of us were experimenting with punk in Studio Two. And when the two worlds collided in the corridor, there was actually never a problem, because Mark really liked the young new musicians, and they really loved him. They had real respect for him, which is more than they had for me, understandably. Sex Pistols, you can hear them warming up in the background even now. Take it away! Sex Pistols first, and in terms of live music, only TV appearance. We gave them three minutes, they took seven. We couldn't stop them, and they trashed the set. It was the end of a long day for my producer, Chris Pye. The really worst moment of the day was that we rehearsed in the afternoon, as I recall, about four o'clock. And as always at Granada, what was going on was put on the internal TV system. So everybody, if they chose to be on Channel 15, or it was, could see it. And, and Lord Bernstein, Sidney Bernstein, was upstairs in his suite on the sixth floor, the seventh floor. And he saw this rehearsal, and during the rehearsal, the sex pistols were wearing swastika armbands. He thought this was a really dreadful notion. <laughs> Not a good idea. And he called down to the box and said, get these people out of the studio. So as I recall, I think you and I had to go into a room and try and persuade Malcolm McLaren and somebody from the band 
that they should do something about this. I made sure that they would never stay in the frame. I always wanted them to move forward or back, and, uh, and if they ever looked like they were being even vaguely polite or serious about what they were doing, I'd have to manifest a situation in which Jordan would have to pick up his, her chair, which she was sitting on in the audience, and throw it across the stage. And of course, in doing so, the, the microphones would at least move, and um, that would create a chaotic sound and um, that would be splendid, I loved that. I had no idea what I felt. It was so stunning what had just gone on. It was so unlike anything ever happened before. I rushed out of the box thinking, I've got to do something. What shall I do? Shall I stop it? Shall I start it? Shall I say it's wonderful? What shall I do? I don't know. <laughs> I was thrilled after the show because we were absolutely loathed by everyone in one of those, I suppose you call, uh, social canteens after the show with cheap white wine and a few grapes. I think that um, the cucumber sandwiches didn't go down very well and um, uh, of course they all had to get back in one of those dreadful dormobiles and head back down the motorway but um, not without um, feeling um, a sense of, uh, of style. Sweet, can we just have a word? Sweet, can you be quiet for... Quiet! We're not offensive people. The music is offensive to a lot of people. Outside the takeaway Saturday night, a bald adolescent offered me out for a fight. Coming from the north, you've got this uh, inoffensive, cap-touching attitude. Which we're trying to break out of. Sweet, can you just... Sweet, shut up! What the hell ever you write about is, is political. It isn't so much how the music industry is as simulated as, is that we've assimilated the music industry. What do you make all that din about? What's the... You got into punk? Here is your actual new wave now. Which is, uh, I've tried that. Kicked me in the balls and said something profound. I can't say nothing about a new wave at all. I don't know what it is. I'm a nerd. A nerd. Yes, Joan a nerd is, uh, is there a, a twit? I can't go back to Salford. The cops have got me marked. Enter the dragon exit. Johnny Clark. See you next week. Worth a million in prizes. Oh, I'm a torch of fame. I'm a GTO. I wear a uniform. All out of government law. Oh, what bliss it was in that dawn to be alive. Basically, at that point in history, the Beeb did not know what was going on, which meant that we had Iggy and the Pistols and the Buzzcocks and Blondie and Elvis Costello and everybody else to ourselves. We could end part two now with any of five or six dozen bands, but we thought we'd end with this lot because it was their first television. They arrived four hours late for the sound check, which caused a riot of their own, which led to the end of Bellevue as a music venue forever. But they were really good at leading community singing.
Mensen, wij! Want dat is mensen, ja! Liquid Advance. Mixes quickly. No lumps, no mess. Sticks and stay stuck. Polyshell, take on the house and win. Royalties. The new current account from the Royal Bank. Call 0800 880 880. There's a lot in it. Cuprinol quick drying wood stain. It's unbelievably good looking. Packed with carbohydrates and seven of the essential vitamins, every bowl of Kellogg's cornflakes is a bowl full of sunshine. So whatever you get up to, get up to Kellogg's cornflakes. Electricity Plus, they take the prices of famous name electrical appliances and they cut them. Then they cut them again. Supercuts at Electricity Plus for a few days only. After Monday, it'll be too late. There's a serial killer out there who strangled three women. His motive is terror, his purpose is murder, and his inspiration is all the famous killers who have come before. Sigourney Weaver, Holly Hunter, Dermot Mulroney, and Harry Connick Jr. Copycat. Heineken Export was first introduced to Italy in 1933, where it's had a huge following ever since. Smooth tasting Heineken Export, the world's favorite import. I'd promised him a look at the old country. It was never going to be easy. It was either too quiet, or when we found some life, you enjoy yourself, don't mind me. Never again, I told myself. But then... We could do France next time. Well, he always said it was better to travel than to arrive.
Creole going through his little red book back in 1984. One of the downsides of doing a show like this is actually the tapes you can't find. If anyone at home videoed the Smiths doing This Charming Man also in 1984, please, would you give us a call? The upside, when it works, is that you can follow an artist's career right from its earliest beginnings. Early 80s, I suppose, uh, um, I was judging a talent contest at uh, a talk of the North Eccles, and uh, I was feeling pretty sad because uh, a lot of the, the groups and performers uh, those days were they were not up to the to, in my mind to some of the people of the you know the real good ruckers and uh, but out walked this um, little girl about 14 and um, uh, I thought she was absolutely brilliant and I was actually presenting a program then called the video entertainers and uh, I booked her for that straight away Years later, we followed the same young lady as she cut her first record and dreamt of stardom. I just always said to the teachers, like, Billy, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a technician. Very good, Billy. Susie, what do you want to be? I want to be a nurse. Lisa, what do you want to be? I'm going to be a pop star. Oh, go away. <laughs> Six years later, that dream came true. For Lisa Stansfield, the rest is history. And talking of history, take a look at this snap from What's On in 77, the group big in Japan. Do you recognize them? Oh, all right. This one just burnt a million. This one just sold a million. This one ran off with Susie, that's their mum. And this fella, well, he was going to pop back in the early 80s to sing us another song. We think he was in his country and western phase then. And a couple of years after that, he was back again to get his feet wet in the docks. I'd say um, my style is influenced by um, basically um, American and English folk guitar. I seem to remember that kind of music, John. That, that sort of thing, yeah. Um, well, basically because there's a lot of space to fill with, with um, Smith stuff, especially live, I just um, take it and sort of try it a little bit more aggressively and go... Uh, <laughs> Those are the influences which have made the guitar fashionable again, Johnny, but I bet you can't tell me where the melodies come from. The answer is, I don't know, really. That's what Mozart used to say, you know. Good old Mozart. Mozart. Hip guy. We can't have any faith in playwrights anymore. We can't have any faith in film stars. Young people don't care about those things. They're, they're dying arts. And if you say, what rights do you have? 
the implication there to me is that you know popular music is quite a low art it should be hidden it can be there but let's not say anything terribly important let's just you know make disco records or whatever indeed Stephen. 88 like 76 and 56 saw a new kind of music being born but other cameras captured the sound and the moral panic as acid house spread from the gay black clubs of chicago and detroit to the warehouses of east lancashire is four vehicles deep. They're on the grass verges, they're on the footpaths, they're in people's drives. One of the neighbours has also seen sex taking place in the garden, uh, which isn't very nice, especially if you have children. There was a red granada came down Chasworth Road with the hazard out, uh, lights flashing, uh, the horn blowing, and suddenly all the lights went on on the cars, <laughs> and it was one huge convoy all the way down Shadsworth Road and then half an hour after they're all coming back again they must have gone to the wrong place <laughs> understandably considering what they were up to this was an explosion as exciting as Mersey Beat or Punk and this was the documentary I mean Gerald was a joy to deal with because we went over to Detroit and met Derek May and that was fine The Inspiral Carpets, bless them, would have been on anything because um, they're just nice guys and you know, would have turned up for anything you asked them to do. The Mondays, well, if you happened to be where they were, then you could film them. Um, they were completely and utterly oblivious. I saw your bass was a little bit too loud, sweet. The Roses was a much more complicated question. Um, their management um, had very particular plans about um, Stone Rose's career pattern um, and basically were you know, interested in exploiting their artist or exploiting their artist's potential, shall we say. I think we could be the biggest band ever. And therefore they felt the offer they were getting from Granada wasn't good enough. We filmed the Roses at the legendary Ali Pali gig, but the footage was never shown. Don't worry, they're coming up after I get nostalgic. Back in Studio 2, and if only these walls could talk, in 1977, Iggy Pop came in here to be interviewed on Granada Reports. Honestly, he sat right here. Behind him, our Hessian backdrop from Granada Reports in those days, his cameraman took a photograph which became the cover of Lust for Life. Very famous picture, and boy, was he in a good mood that day. In the late 80s, we put a white cyclorama just like this up here for a show called The Other Side of Midnight. The Stone Roses did their first TV right here. Their photographer took a picture which became their first promo pictures. And they also used it on their album sleeve. The only music we could afford to feature was local bands. Therefore, it was yeah, people like the Mondays and the Inspiral Carpets, the Stone Roses, who incidentally Wilson didn't want to put on because he didn't like them. All right, I confess, I didn't get on with their management in the early 80s, when after all, they were a pretty tacky goth band anyway. And it did take a song called Elephant Stone to turn me on to them. The band who turned me on to Elephant Stone, they too looked pretty good in the white psych. 
This was the Happy Mondays' first TV appearance. In their second, they started a school programme, shown repeatedly to school children. Happy Mondays formed five years ago. Now they're hoping to make the jump from local following to national fame. It talks on Key 103, and we're speaking to Bez and Sean from Happy Mondays. Afternoon, lads. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to ask you, why has there been such a long gap since the last LP? I don't know. Is it something that comes easy to you going into the studios and making these things? Why are you on Factory? Because no one else wants us. They didn't put on any airs and graces for the cameras or for television. Yeah, they just were who they were and did what they did. And if you didn't like it, you didn't like it. And if you did, they were fantastic. The Monday is at GMAX, and though the Manchester scene imploded, the Northwest in the 90s could still boast the best adult pop band in the world. Oh, you're so nice. <laughs> the best teen pop band in the world? Hi. Hi. And now, some might say, the best band in the world. Oasis were filmed for a half-hour documentary as they hovered on the brink of world domination. I mean, the reason why I wear in every page is because there's something to write about. We're playing the game, and we mean it, and we're honest, and we've got the best songs, so that's why we're in everyone's face at the moment. If I didn't want to be in this band, or if I didn't want to sign autographs, or if I didn't want to, you know, live my life in a fishbowl, I'd just get up from here right now, I'd take my case out of the van, I'd go to the airport and I'd go to Brazil, and nobody could stop me because I've got the money in the bank to do that, but I don't because I want to do it, and I want to be here. <laughs> Just wanna fly, wanna live, but I wanna die. Maybe I just wanna breathe. Maybe I just don't believe. Maybe you're the same as me. We see things I'll never see. Said maybe I don't really wanna know. I'm dying because I just wanna. So the Beatles were at the top. If if there is a top, I say they were at the top. A lot of other bands were sort of like, just not quite there. You know what I mean? That's what it'd be like. And if we can turn them on to the Beatles and the Stones and the Stone Roses and all the rest of it, then you know music goes on, doesn't it? You know, if they go out and buy a few Beatles albums, pick up a guitar and then start a band and influence the next generation of nine-year-olds, then rock and roll won't die. Oasis, August 94, live forever at the Buckley Tivoli. And that about brings us up to date. Except to point out that while the Burnage boys have been ransacking America and being pathetic city fans, we've brought you some of the latest crop. Cast, Marion, Northern Uproar. And right now, I think we should be filming a little band called the Space Monkeys, but they're telling me that we can't because time's up and it's over. As we know, it's never over. See you in 2036.